other candidate in this race uh, is Gerald Dickinson, who we see here now. Uh, so uh, in the interests of, uh, of getting through this, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the 14th Ward Democratic Club for holding this event, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, as uh, many of you know, my name is Jerry Dickinson. Uh, my pathway into politics is not typical, of course. Uh, I came up through the Allegheny County foster care system. I grew up in a multiracial foster home, was adopted into a family of 10 other foster kids, all coming from backgrounds of abandonment and neglect for the entire year, meeting thousands and thousands of voters from Bridgeville to Monroeville, Homewood, Edgewood, Glassport, Portview. Elizabeth Township. Every neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh, I've met thousands of people and listened to thousands of stories. The message is clear. People in this district are ready for change. My opponent, Mr. Doyle, he's been in office for a long time, 25 years, and over that span of time, he's taken hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars from the fossil fuel industry and corporate PACs. And he owns thousands of dollars worth of investments in an oil gas company himself. Now, the question for him isn't whether or not he's done something in that 25 years. The question is whether or not he has done enough. The answer to that question is a resounding no. Congressman Doyle is going to tell you throughout this campaign that he has seniority. What he won't tell you, of course, is that his only leadership position in 25 years in office is the chair of the subcommittee on telecom, which he received in 2019, year after year, he's been passed over for leadership positions. Congressman Doyle is going to tell you that he's an effective legislator, but what he's not going to tell you is that only a handful of his bills have actually been passed into law in over 25 years. Congressman Doyle is going to tell you he's a progressive or has a progressive voting record. What he's not going to tell you outright is that he supports fracking. He's not going to tell you that he voted for the Keystone Pipeline. He's not going to tell you, and he hasn't done so yet, that he affirmatively opposes the uh, Beaver Cracker Plan. He's not going to tell you that he voted to make death penalty appeals more difficult. And he's not going to tell you, of course, here today that he voted in opposition to women's reproductive rights for decades. And of course, Mr. Doyle is going to say how proud he is of this region. But what he's not going to say is that this is the least livable city for African-American women. We're losing our black population every year. And in this region, we have the seventh worst air, worst air quality of any city in the United States due to pollution. We are facing a political crisis in this country and we have a decision to make. We can continue on with the status quo, of course, or we can forge a new progressive path. We don't just have to be okay as we've been under Mr. Doyle. We can aspire for greatness in this safe, heavily democratic blue district. We can be big, we can be bold. We can fight for Medicare for all and make it a reality. We we're, can we're ban fracking. Now. We can move away from petrochemical plants, fair wages, affordable housing, and criminal justice reform. So join me on, on June 2nd to make history and to reject the status quo. And I appreciate uh, I would appreciate the endorsement of the 14th Ward uh, Democratic Club. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that all of the candidates have, uh, have had a difficult time remembering to say the new election day at the end of their speeches. Um, so we'll take a, a little bit of extra time on the questions here since we did so with uh, Congressman Doyle. Sure. All right, uh, thank you. So we have a couple of questions in the chat that were identified as being for, for both of you. So I'm going to go back and uh, and try to find those. Uh, would could you talk a bit about your thoughts on ethane cracker plants in the Ohio Valley? Yeah, sure. Um, I am uh, opposed to uh, the cracker plants, uh, and we've got to move uh, as quickly as possible, moving away from petrochemical uh, as it is uh, polluting our water, polluting our communities. Uh, obviously, it's having a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Uh, the environmental justice impacts of these industries uh, is, uh, is exponential. And if we don't uh, move and act now, of course, we're going to be reaping uh, uh, the repercussions for decades to come. And so I'm someone who wants to aggressively fight uh, uh, to bring and regulate out these industries uh, and ban them. And then also, of course, move uh, swiftly, aggressively uh, towards uh, uh, renewable uh, solar and wind industries as soon as possible, because that, that's the future of our country in terms of energy, and why not start that process now? Thank you. And remind everybody, if you'd like to be heard specifically, put your hand up, we'll, we'll put you in the line. Uh, Pam Harbin asked this question of, sure. of both candidates. Uh, do you support the Betsy DeVos COVID-19 proposal for micro grants, uh, which she says is a voucher program? 
Yeah, no, of course not. I do not. Uh, and the Trump administration uh, has had a, uh, a damaging impact on our educational system uh, and uh, the consequences are going to be felt for, for years. And so, no, I do not uh, support that. Um, I am a, a huge advocate of uh, federal dollars and the federal government playing a significant role in our public education system. Uh, I'm all about capacity building. And so we need federal dollars to be uh, funneled to our local and state uh, governments uh, to actually identify the deficiencies in our public schools, even here in Pittsburgh, and then work those resources into those public schools to make them even better. Uh, and that is first and foremost, the most important thing that we have to do uh, in order to get our uh, educational system to become equitable across race and socioeconomic lines as well. Thank you. Uh, let's, sure. let's go to Greg next, and then I have uh, one from the chat, and then we'll do sure. Hey, um, <clears throat> Greg Kuchansky here. Hi, Greg. Um, we've heard from some of the Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania regional unions that they really want these cracker plants, and they're willing to threaten support threatened to not support Democratic candidates. Sure. Um, and uh, you can sort of see why. I mean, they, it, it, they're, 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 they're in with sure. the fossil fuel unions. They have their jobs. Um, and sure. they aren't in with the sol solar and, and wind industries yet. Sure. How do we deal with this situation? I mean, we don't want to give up on the unions because we think they're, they're important for, for sort of workers' rights. Sure. Um, but on the other hand, we don't really want to give up on the environment yeah. either. Sure. Yeah. Look, the unions are the bedrock of our of our Democratic Party, right? And uh, and they have a, a role to play in Democratic Party politics uh, now uh, and in the future. Uh, the one thing that we need to think about here is that the the, the discussion about the uh, climate change, pollution, uh, is this kind of uh, jobs versus the environment. That's a bit of a false dichotomy here. We can do both. Uh, and if you look at the Green New Deal, for example, which I'm a strong supporter of, and Mr. Doyle is not, uh, you know, it has a federal jobs guarantee program, right? This is something that Jesse Jackson back in the 1980s had proposed, and of course, uh, uh, Senator Sanders uh, supports this as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we are transitioning uh, uh, unions and families who are benefiting from the fossil fuel industry. We want to uh, transition them into this new renewable uh, uh, energy environment in the future. Look, for example, New York. New York has uh, shifted uh, towards, uh, uh, well, it banned fracking, of course, had a moratorium on fracking and other bans and regulations on, on uh, petrochemicals, right? What, what was the result of that? Uh, of course, was 60, 70,000 permanent jobs that were created by the solar and wind industry, right? So it's a, it's a bit of a federalist example of a state actually taking the initiative to make a change uh, with regards to how we actually uh, bring in our energy. And that's extremely important. Uh, the other thing here is understanding that many of the families, of course, who are benefiting from the fossil fuel industry, uh, uh, those jobs, the skill sets they have can be seamlessly absorbed and transitioned into a, a green new manufacturing industry. It just takes political will. It also takes congressmen and women like Mr. Doyle to stop taking money from the energy and oil and gas industries because, of course, uh, they are at that point, they are tied into those industries and have to do their bidding in Congress. And so we have to start rethinking uh, uh, from a political standpoint what it is that we really care about. Do we care about those major industries that are giving us the $1,000 checks uh, as congressperson, or are we going to buck the trend and do something different and do something big and bold? And that's what this campaign is about. That's what we're pushing forward here uh, in this uh, historic race here in the 18th Congressional District. Thank you. Thanks for uh, that question. Great. I have a, uh, a question that came to me privately in the chat, uh, which is the very undivisive. Uh, what is your position on foreign aid to Israel? So, sorry, what's that? What is your position on foreign aid to Israel? Yeah, look, you know, uh, we, you know, the, the Israeli-Palestine uh, uh, debate is something that is uh, always uh, within the, 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 the talking point within the Democratic Party, and it's an extremely important one. Uh, you know, I'm in a, of the position, I'm a, a human rights activist. I did uh, international uh, uh, work in the law, international law in South Africa on a Fulbright scholarship. In fact, I did a lot of work in settlements uh, in South Africa. And so I understand the issues uh, that are going on in Israel with regards to settlements, and oftentimes uh, some of the uh, uh, actions that are being taken that in many ways do violate international law. Uh, and so I'm someone as a lawyer who's very uh, concerned about that. And so, you know, the one thing we do have to think about uh, as Americans and as Congresspersons is to the extent that uh, we are aiding 
uh, some uh, action uh, that is uh, potentially uh, in violation of, of international law over there uh, in Israel, between Israel and Palestine. And so I'm acutely aware of that and I'm concerned about it, of course, and I would be someone who would be, you know, bold and on the front lines, having a discussion, willing to have that conversation about uh, international laws that, uh, that are impacting, of course, uh, people overseas uh, on, on this uh, particular matter, so. Thank you. Let's, let's take a question from Miriam. Yeah, I wanted to hear more specifically, uh, Jerry, what you would do to, again, I like that question about what's the, how do we communicate to people who are economically dependent on fracking right now? Yeah. How do we, how would you concretely propose getting solar cell plants and wind industry in, in those areas? Yeah. What yes, I would be the Green New Deal. What does it say? I don't I don't know. Right. Yeah. So I would be uh, on the front lines. Uh, and this is what's interesting about the 18th congressional district. It's a safe blue district. So we can take these bold stances on uh, the energy question. And uh, I would be one of a few members of Congress uh, when elected uh, who would be a, a huge supporter of the Green New Deal. And I would and I've taken a position that I would be on the front lines as the leader uh, to bring federal subsidies directly into uh, this district, into this area uh, for solar and wind. And so people should realize that uh, on day one, in January of 2021, uh, I would be pushing that, that conversation, letting people know that while we start to move away from fossil fuel industries, we have a plan in place already. Federal subsidies that are gonna incentivize these uh, solar and wind industries to build. Uh, and then, of course, swiftly moving towards uh, helping to transition those families with those same skill sets into these jobs and letting them know that we're, uh, that we, uh, that we're thinking about them, we care about them. We don't want to make the same mistakes that we've made in the past uh, with regards to the steel industry, right? Uh, we thought that uh, the, the private sector and the markets were going to uh, take care of everything uh, when the steel mills started to close. And, of course, we didn't have a massive governmental uh, program. The, the New Deal was now uh, dissolving at that point. We didn't have the, the social cushioning to help families transition from a, a post uh, a steel industry. We don't wanna make that same mistake again. So we wanna let people know that these, these fossil fuel industries are only gonna be around for another 10, 20 years or so. And we don't wanna make that same mistake and that's why we care about them. We wanna uh, ensure that we're moving towards a green new manufacturing industry and that they are primary uh, uh, persons who we care about uh, to actually make this move, so. All right, I think next up we have Liz Healy. Hi Liz. Um, hi, I have a question for you, Jerry. Um, can you, can you um, review for us? I know in answer to Pam's question, you said that you would not support the voucher program that was part of the um, COVID-19 overall package. Would you support vouchers under any conditions? So uh, the voucher question at the federal level, I do not support any privatization of, uh, or programs that move us towards privatization of our public school system uh, through the school choice uh, programs. And so uh, I do not think the federal government should be uh, uh, subsidizing that and providing vouchers on that level. However, that being said, uh, as we move towards uh, uh, our, our, our priority, of course, which is public education and capacity building in our school districts, we also do need to recognize that there are a significant number of, of uh, poor students uh, many of them being uh, racial minorities here in the Pittsburgh area and elsewhere um, uh, that are uh, in distressed neighborhoods and distressed school districts. And so the one thing we do need to consider and be aware of is that uh, scholarships uh, to allow some of the most talented uh, uh, students who are poor uh, and many of them who are racial minorities, the most, the most talented students uh, need to have an opportunity. And so uh, we should still be understanding that as we move forward to fighting uh, this fight for public resources in our public education system, um, uh, we do need to be aware of that, that there are some talented students out there who, uh, if uh, they're not assisted with and helped, uh, uh, they're gonna be doomed to uh, a distressed uh, educational opportunity. And uh, that's not what I wanna see, uh, especially for uh, you know, uh, African-Americans uh, in this uh, region as well. It's, a, it's an important, important point for me. Um, I'm public school educated, uh, Shaler area. Uh, my adoptive parents uh, uh, graduated from McKees Fort High and I have foster sister who graduated from uh, Wilkinsburg. And so uh, public education is extremely uh, important for me on that, on that uh, topic. Thank you. I think those are all the questions. Mac, have you, do you have any other? I, I, we've got uh, one that just came through on the, uh, sure. Um, on the chat. And Go so it says, would you ask Jerry if he has been supportive of Clarence Thomas in the past? And if so, to please explain. 
supportive of Clarence Thomas. I, 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 that I, all the information I have is what I just said. I sure. I, I, the question, I think it should be modified in terms of do I agree and support Clarence Thomas's originalist uh, jurisprudence, uh, which I don't. As many of you know, I'm a constitutional law professor and I teach constitutional law and property law. Uh, and so, uh, uh, no, uh, in terms of his jurisprudence, I certainly do not. Um, you know, uh, members of the Supreme Court, uh, the, the split right now, 5-4, uh, extremely uh, leading in the uh, right-wing conservative uh, uh, movement is uh, is certainly concerning for me. And uh, uh, Justice Thomas's uh, opinions are extremely problematic. And I teach these uh, these decisions uh, in my uh, first year of law school uh, courses. And uh, you know, uh, originalism is is a dangerous philosophy. And uh, Justice Thomas has been on the front lines of that. And I think that's a uh, uh, very concerning. And uh, and so no for for. Uh, many reasons. I do not support uh, Clarence Thomas's uh, uh, legal philosophy and jurisprudence uh, whatsoever. Okay.